Hello and welcome to the latest edition of our Antibiotic Reduction Expert Series. My name is Ryan Hines. I'm the Communications Manager at Biomin. Uh, today we're going to be talking about producing quality silage for maximum energy utilization. I'm joined by two Biomin experts. Vesna Jenkins. Hi, Vesna. Hi, Ryan. Hi, everybody. And Ignacio Artavia. Hi, Ignacio. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not able to hear you. Perhaps you've been muted. Yes, correct. Hello. Hello to everybody. Thank you. Great. Let's uh, start with a, a round of introductions. Um, Vesna, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at Biomed. Yes. Yes, I'm Vesna Jenkins. Uh, I'm Global Product Manager at Biomin, uh, responsible for uh, Biomin Biostable product line of silage inoculants. So my educational background is agronomy, animal and plant sciences. Uh, prior to Biomin, I was also working in the same industry in New Zealand as a researcher, project and product manager. Excellent. We're glad you could join us today. And Ignacio, tell us a bit about yourself. Hello, I'm Ignacio Artavia. I work here in the headquarters of Biomin and I support farmers and technical advisors and people working also in feed mills in a mycotoxin risk assessment. So I, I work as a product manager for Mycopix in Biomin and I'm happy to be here with you guys to talk about uh, silage, myco, Mycopix uh, solutions and in general. Thank you. Absolutely. So right before we get started on our topic today, I just wanted to remind our live audience, this is an interactive session, right? So that means that at any point, if you have a question for Ignacio or Vesna, you can go ahead and use the chat function in your platform and enter your question. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we can uh, when we get to the Q&A session after the presentations. Uh, it also means that we're going to be able to ask you a couple of questions, audience poll questions where you can share your thoughts and opinions with us and we'll make that part of today's discussion as well. Uh, but let's turn now to the main topics that we're going to cover when we're talking about producing quality silage for maximum energy utilization. So for the next hour, and if we could go ahead and move forward and advance the slide, we're gonna have an outline of the main topics that we're gonna be covering with you today. And we're going to be hearing first from Vesna, and then we'll also hear from Ignacio. If we can get to our outline, and there we are, great. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the principles in the ensiling process, uh, different types of silage inoculants, and what they can contribute to the process and to the output, the fumonazins, type of mycotoxin, and how they could affect ruminants negatively, and how to solve those using biomed solutions. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we'll have a dedicated session at the end where we'll field questions and answers from you, our listeners. So let's start with a question to our listeners. As I mentioned before, we're going to be able to get your opinions on some topics. We're going to start with your experience of silage additives. So here's our first poll question. Which type of silage additive do you most often use or recommend? I want to go ahead and ask you to please select the one best answer that fits your scenario. And in your situation, you may be in a consultant role recommending product or maybe using it yourself when you're producing your silage. You can choose any of the answers listed here. None, a biological silage additive, chemical silage additive, including acids or acid salts, or enzymes. And we see that many of you have jumped in and we already have 60% of everyone has selected one of these answers here. So we're gonna go ahead in just a moment, get everyone else who wants to have a chance uh, to weigh in to do so now. And we're gonna close the poll. We're gonna have a look at those results. So thank you for everyone for uh, sharing your thoughts here. Let's have a look at what you said. We had 17% who are not currently using or recommending a silage additive. Uh, the biological silage additive option, the silage inoculants, uh, was a strong favorite at 65%. The chemical silage additives, either acids or acid salts, came in at 17%, and 2% of you had enzymes. Vesna, uh, I'd like to turn to you now and ask you, what do you think about those results? 
Thanks, Brian. Yes, I, I think it's a it's a great uh, great response. Uh, so society inoculants uh, are uh, well researched and uh, um, applicable on the field, proven in the science. So it's a very good choice for improving um, fermentation and also to uh, reducing spoilage once when silos is open. Yeah, I'm very glad to hear this response, even though from the market we can hear that still there is a lot, lot of potential over there for um, increasing the awareness of uh, roles of silage inoculants uh, in, in the making good quality silage. All right, well then let's get to that right now. If you would go ahead and get into your prepared remarks uh, and, and let's deep, dig deeper into this topic of the ensiling process and different types of silage inoculants that are available. That's right. So let me start with the description. What is it that we are expecting from, from our silage once when, when we close the silos, how the process will go and what, what comes out. So excellent silage quality means that such, such silage will maintain good animal health, sustain milk production, and assure good fertility of the animals. So these are the end goals which we want to have from, from the feed we are feeding our animals. So what the, the excellent silage quality have? So it has high energy, which will lead to less energy to be, to be purchased in, uh, to add to the feed if, if we maintain high energy in the silage. Also, if we maintain um, high protein in the silage, meaning less protein to be purchased. We know how the other sources of protein are very expensive. So it's uh, our, in our power that we do everything we can to save this protein in the crops uh, uh, which, which we harvested. Also, excellent, uh, very good silage quality has to have good palatability. Uh, that will lead to better uh, feed intake. Without feed intake, we can't expect uh, uh, sustainable milk production, but also not uh, good animal health. And also, excellent silage quality means that silage is hygienically good. What does it mean? This means that less load of pathogens uh, as well as mycotoxins risk. Let me guide you just uh, quickly through the uh, stages of the uh, two important stages of the of the fermentation and uh, later on the feed out, which are very important to achieve excellent silage quality. Uh, and it is all, of course, uh, coming first from the very good silage management, which we are also will mention in the next slides. But let's start from the start. So um, important is once when we close the silo to achieve this rapid acidification in the silage. So to assure that this anaerobic part of the fermentation goes in the right direction. Just for your illustration here, um, I, I will present you the, the few phases which are happening during this uh, uh, process of anaerobic fermentation. So the first is the plant respiration. So the plant respiration starts already when we cut the crop. So when we cut the forage or crop, uh, the plants are still trying to live and they are using the uh, nutrients or sugar inside to maintain their they life quasi. And also, um, the proteolytic enzymes which are in plant uh, are awakened and they are starting also to, to degradate the protein. So that's why it's very important that after cutting the forage that we uh, ensile them as, as soon as possible, but also in the very first phases when, when all of this happening, it's uh, important that it doesn't take too long. So the, the plant will take oxygen and uh, this oxygen will, with the time will reduce. So this phase normally takes about one day. And then we will see here that the temperature during this process is also increasing. And it could go even to the, um, like something like, like 35 to 38 degrees uh, during the, this, this, this type of timing. After that, um, acetic acid bacteria start also to, to proliferate and to produce acetic acid. Uh, using sugar. Uh, at this stage, we will see already pH going down and also temperature will calm down. So that is something which happened in day two. From the day three to day, day six is the phase three, which we say initiation of lactic acid production. So lactic acid bacteria start to wake up 
and produce lactic acid, which will then also further drop the pH. We know that lactic acid is very strong and this will influence the further uh, uh, or rapid down of, of pH. Lactic acid uh, bacteria proliferation um, getting the peak in the fourth phase, which is uh, from the day seven to day 21. In this phase, actually the fermentations should be finished. In some situations, depending on the crop as well of the dry matter, it could be within of two weeks or maximum three weeks. We could see then a peak in lactic acid production or acetic acid. So the, the temperature was stabilized, the pH stabilized, and then after three weeks uh, or even earlier in some situation, we achieve the quiet state, meaning storage state. From that on point, we can keep our silage for many months or year like that if it's protected properly. And the second very important aspect is the feed out phase to achieve aerobic stability of the silage. So this is a crucial to get at the end uh, silage we are feeding to the animals to be in the excellent state. Because even if we have this first anaerobic fermentation process going well, if the silage ha doesn't have uh, um, aerobic stability at the feed out, it can everything go very fast, very wrong as uh, stated here from the Professor Kung uh, one of very well known uh, personalities in the silage world from the University of Delaware, uh, who said that could be really a domino effect and happen very fast that we have massive spoilage. So let's see what's happening in the feed out phase. So once when we open the silos, oxygen will be introduced and the air is the biggest enemy of the silage and, and deterioration of the silage. So when the oxygen is introduced, the microbes which love oxygen, those are mostly yeast and, and, and different type of uh, bacteria, undesirable bacteria and moles will start to proliferate. So they will use sugar, they will use starch, they will use lactic acid. So those are all good nutrients which, which are going to be used. As, and as a result, they will produce carbon dioxide, alcohol and heat. And then we will see increase of temperature and uh, on the other side, we will see also a decline of lactic acid because these undesirable microbials will, will use a lactic acid. And it will all will lead to the higher pH, which then really wake up even other undesirable microorganisms to drive the, those ones who love um, higher pH. And all of this would lead to the loss of dry matter, loss of nutrients, which will increase the feed costs. And from the literature, we could see that if the temperature at the feed out increased by 10 degrees Celsius, the dry matter intake can drop as 18%. So this is a huge influence on dry matter intake and with that also on the animal productivity and health. So just a short reminder about good silage management. So this is really essential from the harvest to the feed outs. So we have to take care of optimal maturity at harvest. What does it mean? So it's meant to harvest the crops when they are high in nutrients. That will uh, lead also to the ability to compact better. But also when we harvest earlier rather than later, there will be also low fungal infestation of the crops in the field. Optimal dry matter content and assigning, very important. And how much it is depending on the crops as well as the use technology. Chopping is another very important aspect. It's also chopping lengths depends on the dry matter content of the crop. And for the corn silage, very important to use a kernel cracker. So at the end, very, very important aspect is how the silage uh, pit is compacted. So it should be really evenly compacted so strongly so that this or air is squeezed to the, so that we achieve anaerobic condition, which will then drive a very good fermentation. After we do good compaction, of course, proper sealing is also essential. 
do not save on the on the plastic which uh, should be put on the walls as well as the top so high quality plastic will save you money uh, so um, to not get uh, dry metal losses to not get the loss of nutrients so uh, very important to invest into this part as well and also once when the silo is uh, covered properly regular checking on the um, damages from bird or rodents is important so to check there is no holes because with each hole in oxygen will air will be introduced and we said this is the biggest enemy uh, for the for the achieving of the good silage management uh, putting the heavy weights uh, on the on the plastic sheets is also very important to keep the silage um, pit safe from um, from wind blowing this uh, out and messing up with this. After we open the silos, uh, another management strategy uh, has to be uh, discussed or appropriately done, meaning um, keeping the face of the silage clean and also having appropriate removal rate depending uh, where you are, what climate you are in and, and, and such stuff. And also, as a scientist, as, as a very uh, fan of uh, biological inoculants, use proven, scientifically proven silage inoculants to improve anaerobic fermentation and also to achieve aerobic stability, better aerobic stability once when silos is open. So it's all about competition for fermentation substrate or for nutrients. We have good microbes like lacto lactic acid bacteria, which could be homofermentative or heterofermentative, or bad microbes like yeast, mold, clostridia, or enterobacteria. And in our game of making good silage, the good microbials like lactic acid bacteria must win this war, let's say like this. So we need to suppress proliferation of all of these listed bad microbials. Just for illustration, as well, very interesting. Um, um, let's say survey was was done, and one of the very influential um, worldwide uh, dairy personality, Professor Mike Pilsen, was asked once uh, in the in the one of the prestigious American journals if we can if he can choose which one of the feed additives uh, he would consider to be the most important on the farm on the dairy farm or beef farm doesn't matter so and he said on the second place it is silage inoculant so there are different silage additives which we can use but uh, to stimulate fermentation this is the right choice so use of bacteria inoculants of uh, biological uh, silage uh, additives on the other side there is also um, organic acid and their salts could be used and they are there to inhibit fermentation. When they inhibit fermentation, they will inhibit the growth of good bacteria as well. So silage inoculants for high quality silage are proven through the science, but also in the field condition. They are effective additives to drive good fermentation, to protect nutrients, also prolong the bunker shelf life meaning reduce pathogens load in the silage, achieving higher hygiene and palatability of silage, meaning increased animal performance and farm profitability. Let me introduce you a biomine biostable silage uh, inoculants uh, line. So in, in our product line, we have different products uh, targeting different crops, and they have three bacteria inside and depending which crops are we are ensiling, there will be different ratio of these three bacteria. So all of these strains listed here, Lactobacillus plantarum, Lactobacillus brevi, and Lactobacillus kefiri, are owned by Biomin. They are registered in the European Union and have positive opinion of EPSA. For Lactobacillus plantarum, we have positive opinion that reduces pH very fast, uh, particularly during the early stages of fermentation. I will demonstrate you in a minute in the slides showing your latest scientific research done with not one of our products. For Lactobacillus brevis, we have also positive opinion from EFSA to reduce the number of clostridia and also improve fermentation from moderately to difficult silage. 
Prolactobacillus kefiri. It's a unique strain, really uh, just found uh, with, within um, environment, and it has potential to improve aerobic stability of the silage. Um, again, I will show you several trials showing this uh, proof. So why we choose two heterofermentative strain? Because we saw in our research the combination of this unique combination of these two strains, Lactobacillus brevis and Lactobacillus kefiri, can achieve optimum acetic acid for uh, optimum aer aerobic stability as well as a good palatability. We don't want acetic acid to explode to be too high because um, then uh, palatability will be uh, compromised. So it's very important that it is in the proper range, let's say between um, 1.5 to 3.5% of dry matter. As, uh, as, as, as uh, I said earlier, so our strains are very powerful. So the combination is chosen um, based on the research and also a latest research we done with uh, one of our product, Biomin Biostable Plus with the Swedish University of Agriculture show us that uh, product is capable of very fast acidification, early very fast acidification of the silage meaning fast pH drop and maintaining this uh, low pH during the uh, whole storage, which will ensure then that the dry metal losses, as you can see on the right side, are less, so less dry metal losses when uh, Biomin Biostable Plus was, was applied, comparing to the control when dry metal losses are higher. And you can see here as well how pH couldn't really drop uh, enough below. In the silage, we would like in the grass silage, we would like to see pH around 4.2, maximum 4.5. So we can see nicely drop of pH uh, uh, with the application of Biostable Plus. Um, in this uh, research with, with Swedish Agricultural University, we had uh, 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 trials as well where we um, actually challenged the, the, the forage with Clostridia spores. So we introduced the Clostridia into the silage to see how the Biostable Plus can um, suppress this proliferation of Clostridia. And uh, on the slide left, you can see, on the graph left, you can see clearly how after 90 days of fermentation, we could not find Clostridia spores in the silage inoculated with Biostable Plus in comparison to the control where Clostridia spores uh, are very, very, very much present. So that's reflected as well as a, in the energy content of the silage. We can see here the value of net energy lactation higher uh, in the silage inoculated with Biomin Biostable Plus comparing to the uh, not inoculated silage. In terms of aerobic stability, um, also we, uh, we had a look at the different openings, even though we don't recommend silage to be open very early, but in the praxis, we know the farmers are running out of the feed and they are forced to open the silos even after two or three weeks, in some situation even earlier. But um, so we've looked at the, at the all openings, uh, how stable is the silage when it's uh, inoculated uh, with uh, biomine Biostable Plus. And in each of the opening, you can see how uh, in the green line, how the silage inoculated with Biostable Plus stayed the stable at all openings comparing to the uh, control silage where we can see heating already within a few hours, so 24 hours is already a big peak here. So uh, we also um, registered that this control silage has a lower acetic acid. So acetic acid, again, very important, has antifungal, antimicrobial properties, so particular antifungal properties. So suppressing proliferation on desirable microorganism uh, like a yeast, and with that suppressing the elevation of the, of the temperature. Because if we have elevation of the temperature like seen in, in those early openings, so the nutrients will decline, and with that, the palatability of the silage. This is also a scientific trial done with the Lithuanian University of Health Science with the second of our 
uh, products, uh, biomine biostable mains, uh, uh, which is also proven to uh, increase aerobic stability in the maize silage. You can see on the left side the uh, almost double more time, um, uh, more stable uh, silage than in the control, to start to, which starts to heat even after, after several hours. So longer aerobic stability in silage with biostable maize leading to preserved feed value, higher palatability and better animal productivity. And indeed in this trial, um, we didn't just look at the fermentation or nutritional profile of the silage, uh, we also looked at the uh, performance of the animals. So we could see here from the nutritional profile, the less trimethylosters, more lactic acid, more acetic acid in the silage uh, inoculated with biostable maize, and also higher net energy lactation uh, is observed. Um, in terms of animal production, we measured energy corrected milk as well as, as, well as the milk yield and uh, all of this box in the green showing uh, biostable uh, results. We could see the animals within a week or week in having better uh, milk yield than uh, in the grain box are the control animals. So with this, I, uh, I will finish my part of the presentation. Uh, again, with the emphasis that uh, yes, proven, scientifically proven silage inoculants can help you to achieve excellent silage uh, quality, which will lead to better animal health and also better animal performance. Ignacio, please take Thank the Thank you, Vesna. Thank you, Vesna. So let's just take control of the... Okay, so now let's talk about mycotoxins and how this can affect the health of the cows and how can this come also through the maize silage that we are feeding to the cows. So this is a general overview of mycotoxins in cows, in dairy cows. So they, we have different effects uh, that are coming since the intake, the reduction of the intake of the cows, some nervous, defect, nervous effects, uh, effects in the rumen, which can have a negative uh, results in liver health, in laminitis, for example, uh, it can have an effect on immunity and also even reproductive effects. But today we're not going to talk about all the mycotoxins, but we're going to focus on one that is particular to pumonis, to for, sorry, to to corn or to maize. Sorry, I cannot pass the slide. Okay, there we are. <laughs> so this group of mycotoxins that we're going to talk uh, and focus on today is, we, these are the pumonicins, and they are relevant uh, because they are uh, produced by fusarium uh, groups of molds, we, which are very prominent uh, groups of uh, molds especially in hot or moderate climates. And they affect mainly maize and maize byproducts. So we can expect to see them very commonly in maize silage. Actually, uh, these are the results of maize contamination only in Europe. And we can see that for the last uh, 10 years, uh, it's been always present at more than a 70% of the samples that have been analyzed in the biomine mycotoxin survey, which is the most uh, comprehensive survey in, in, in the world. And if we can see, not only they are prevalent, but they are also present in very high concentration. So they are usually around uh, 1500 ppv. And this can tell us that, yes, uh, corn is a special target of the fumonisins. But what is the problem with fumonisins? So, First of all, the problem is that we generally think that rumen, that the rumen of the cow is capable of de detoxifying the mycotoxins that come, that come through the feed to the cows. But as we can see in these graphs on the right side, these are different uh, studies that have looked at the degradation by the rumen of the fumonisins. 
And you can see on the red portion, which is that uh, the portion that after 72 hours could not be degraded by the ruminant microbiota. So ruminants are completely or mostly unprotected to the fumonisins. And you could say, okay, but we have the binders. Well, typical binding is not really an option. Why? Because yes, it may bind at, the, at lower pHs, but as the digesta ad advances towards the intestine, this will be released and will be uh, available for absorption in uh, the intestine. So typical binding is not really an option. So what are the main effects of humonisins in, in dairy cows? What can we expect to see as negative effects in our cows? Well, so first of all, we, will, we can get a decrease in dry matter intake. So the least thing you want to cause by the, feed, uh, by the silage that you feed to your cows is that they will decrease the intake of, of, of it because the, 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 the less that your cow eats, the less it will be able to produce. And nextly, it can affect the intestinal health. So there, there's plenty of literature proving the negative effects uh, that the fumonisins have over the mucin production, which is the layer that covers the intestinal epithelium, and also reduced tight junction, which means that more pathogens or mycotoxins or also endotoxins can be absorbed because the intestine is less protected. Additionally, we can expect from fumonisins uh, also acute symptoms like liver lesions when the concentrations are high enough. And otherwise, we can also observe a increased concentration of liver enzymes, which can tell us that the liver, that the liver is not capable of working properly for, for ensuring health of the cow. And additionally, we have immune modul modulation. So fumonisins are capable of weakening the immune system of the cow which will uh, uh, lead the way to uh, more infections or being more um, able to get infected more easily. So we have uh, one question for uh, the public right now. Absolutely, let's go to our audience now. So uh, Ignacio, you've really pointed out uh, some of the dangers uh, and uh, brought some new information regarding fumonisins and how uh, it would probably be wise to control them. Uh, let's turn to our audience now and ask them what their approach would be. Uh, perhaps they're doing this already, or perhaps uh, they are now considering that they might need a tool uh, to combat fumonisins. What tool would you use to solve the fumonisins problem in your silage? Please go ahead and pick one answer that you think is best. And uh, now Ignacio has just said it, uh, so this might be a test of listening skills, a simple, Typical binder is one option. A silage acidifier is another option. An enzyme that degrades fumonisins irreversibly, so it's the third, or not sure, right? So please go ahead and pick the one best answer. Uh, again, we have a very uh, lively audience. More than half of you have already voted. We're going to give everyone just another moment uh, to go ahead and weigh in, and then we're going to have a look at these answers. Uh, but I think we will see that there is a clear preference among you. So with more than two thirds of our live audience having voted, let's go ahead and put those results up. I'll read them out for you right now. We can see that 18% of you uh, have said, you know, I would use a, or I do use a simple typical binder. 13% uh, indicated silage acidifier. A full majority, 51% uh, have chosen an enzyme that degrades fumonisins irreversibly and 18% are not sure. So, Ignacio. Perfect, Is yes. there one correct answer here? Have, has the collective wisdom shown, proven correct? Yes, there, there is uh, one correct uh, option, but let's go through each of them to first uh, see why uh, that one is correct. So first, a simple typical binder, well, we already showed uh, how yes, it might bind, but only at low pH. So at the rumen, it can uh, bind it. Uh, but as it will move forward to the intestine, it will be released, which means that we're just moving the absorption from one place to further in the in the in the digestive tract. So the first answer is not correct because of that. 
The second uh, was a silage acidifier. Although you can control the growth of mold from this in the silage with an acid uh, additive, uh, you cannot do anything about the contamination that came already from the field and the mycotoxins that came that were already in the plant and that are all, that are coming to the to the silage. So, however, there are you can limit the development of mold in the silage. And yes, uh, this could be getting close to the right answer. And the third one is an enzyme that degrades it uh, irreversibly. So this would be the correct option. And now let's talk about why this is the correct option. Sure. So Pumzyme has been in the market uh, already for about eight years. So it's the enzyme that was developed for the deactivation of humonisins. It is unique and specific for the biotransformation of this particular uh, uh, mycotoxin. So it means that it's very, uh, very targeted to it. Uh, by, this, uh, uh, by this enzyme, we arrive to a hydrolysis from, and we convert it from foam to the detoxified hydrolyzed pumonisin version. So, however, now uh, today we want to announce and to let you know about this new solution that we have. So it's a pumzyme that is uh, developed to be applied in uh, your silage. So this is a very innovative approach to my mycotoxin degradation. Is the first uh, deactivation method that can be used as a silage additive and however it's it's not uh, completely new it is coming from a from a, um, a technology that has been proven for eight years but now we put it in, in into an application that allows us to treat the feed before we feed it to the cows so this is the innovation that we're presenting now and the, and the best part of it is that it is very easy to apply in combination with any other silage additive, such as biostabil or uh, acid um, acid based uh, preservatives. Actually, we are pleased to do, uh, announce that exactly this Monday uh, we received the EFSA approval for the Fumzyme silage. So we're very happy to announce it today. It was not planned, but happily, was not planned that it would be exactly for this webinar. So, but happily we can show it to you uh, today. So this is for use in all species because we know also swine, uh, for swine uh, nutrition, we also use uh, silage additives. And this is also uh, possible to be used uh, in these species. So how does this application go? Uh, it's very simple. You just dilute the product in, uh, in, in water, in uh, room temperature water. You put it into the, um, into the applicator tank in your silage harvester, and you just start applying together with any other silage additive. And then the procedure of uh, packing and closing the silage goes as usual. So just for you to um, have clear the efficacy of this product, so we have done many trials, more than seven trials to prove the efficacy of this, and also in order to get to get the EFSA approval, we have proven that um, it is working. So in whole corn, corn plant silage with uh, contaminations of 2,800 ppv, we had a control and the, the Fumzyme treatment, and you can see that after seven days, 90% of the pumonisins were degraded. So after seven days uh, of having the, the silage in the, in the feed bunk. This is uh, great because first you have a very highly contaminated uh, silage, and what, at the moment that you feed it to your cows, you're, you can rest assured that your cows will not be uh, affected by it. And at the same time, you are not affecting negatively the fermentation parameters of your silage, uh, which are expressed as pH or lactic acid and many other parameters that we're not showing today because, of, uh, because we want to be more concise. The same goes on for high moisture corn silage in the case of uh, farms which are also feeding uh, what what we call uh, high moisture corn silage, corn cob mix, uh, haylage, etc. 
So in this case, we used a contamination of 1400 PPV. And also we used it in combination with Biostabil, uh, which uh, Vesna just showed us. And the product works uh, fantastic. So actually, in this case, after six days, there was complete degradation of the fumonicins. And again, with, without affecting negatively the pH or the lactic acid concentrations. So with that, uh, I would like to wrap up this, uh, this webinar that we just had with these take home messages. So as dairy farmers, as efficient dairy farmers, uh, the good silage man management is essential. We cannot skip good silage making. Additionally, uh, it is very important so to enhance anaerobic fermentation and to improve aerobic stability, uh, for example, by using this great tool, Biomin Biostabil Silage Inoculants. And also, it is very important to control fumonicins in silage by the use of this uh, enzyme-based technology that is Fumzyme Silage, so that you can treat the fumonicins before they are fed to the cows. Thank you, and uh, it's it's been a pleasure. Let's take that from there and open it up to questions for either Ignacio or Vesna. Uh, so any of your silage questions that you have, we've already received a number of them. So thank you so far. We're going to uh, start. Let's jump into our first one. Uh, Vesna, we have the question here about what are the main aspects to check for for silage quality? Yes, thanks, Ron. We check the, the first elements which we, we check quasi and which is also reported by the labs when we send the samples is dry matter. So we are checking dry matter when we har before the, we harvest the crop, but we also do checking after the ensiling to see what is the dry matter content in the silage, how much is, is a loss there. But also we are checking on the fermentation profile at, and as well as the nutritional profile of the silage. So we would like to see what is the pH. If the pH dropped uh, on the pro proper level, which we, we, we desire, so that will assure us that fermentation went in the right direction. So from the other parameters we are looking for are organic acids, so we would like to see adequate uh, lactic acid content, adequate acetic acid content inside, uh, but also of course uh, uh, not have uh, um, high or a uh, tall quasi butyric acid, which is not desirable, which will influence uh, palatability, but also explosion of butyric acid in the silage will uh, indicate their fermentation went wrong, that clostridia fermentation was uh, was there, uh, which will wrap then the nutrients uh, like sugar as well as the protein. So we are checking also the ethanol, high ethanol level means that proliferation of the yeast uh, is, is higher than desirable. Um, but of course, we are checking as well a nutritional profile, looking at uh, um, energy level in the silage, also of the crude protein, so that we know how the feed formulation will be done then. So regular checking once the silos is open on the filet, on the silage nutritional profile is also essential because that will change with the time as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question here specifically about the biostable. Um, product line and the quantity of colony forming unions of the lacto um, and bacteria that are in there. Can I think it was on a slide, but can you speak to that for a moment, Vesna? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I said uh, we have a product design for different type of crops. Uh, for example, Biostable Plus is a product which we use in grasses or combination grass and clover or lucerne. Um, and also of whole cereal crops. So in the product, in the in the current version of the concentrated version, we have uh, two times 10 power 11 CFU per gram of the products, which assure um, application of the two times 10 power 5 per CFU per, per gram of silage. For the biostable maize, biostable maize, so we have uh, concentration of the product is uh, one times 10 power 11 for the application rate of one gram per ton of fresh forage which will assure then uh, 1.10 power of 5 uh, CFU per gram of silage. So why the difference in this? Because uh, uh, it's simple, we uh, make emphasis uh, in, the, in, this, in the crops like, uh, like forages, like, like grass, uh, 
uh, legumes as well, we need more support of homofermentative bacteria uh, in, for, for faster acidic acidification and better uh, anaerobic fermentation. So that's uh, an important point, and we've got another question along those lines, as you mentioned, that there are uh, different uh, products that are available for different types of, of silage or haylage materials. Um, for low dry matter grass silage, would you still recommend using an ensiline agent or an inoculant? Does that still make sense? Depends how low it is, really. If it's uh, below the 25 percent, so we might recommend to go with acids rather than solid inoculants. But uh, uh, even with this trial demonstrated with the uh, Swedish Agricultural University, we had uh, on the lower side, we, we particularly targeted to see uh, with lower dry matter content how the product is effective at different openings time. So uh, if you can remember that we were um, opening at two weeks, three weeks, and then um, after uh, six weeks uh, and, <clears throat> and after 12 weeks. So um, we could see that the product is very effective even at that lower dry matter content. Um, the silage inoculants can help as well. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, let's turn to Ignacio. We have a couple of questions regarding uh, feed contamination, right? So you've presented the, the harm and the danger of fumonazins. Um, where do we start when we're talking about testing? What, what are ways to test? How do we tell that fumonazins are there, are a problem? Uh, yeah, let's start with the testing point first. Correct. So what we recommend uh, is usually to uh, first analyze your, your silage. So the best thing, the best practice you can do is to analyze already at the moment of the harvest and check for uh, con general contaminations of mycotoxins. However, um, it, it often happens that uh, contaminations are recurrent. If you last year had a contamination, you can already foresee that uh, the coming year there will be a contamination of the of the same groups of mycotoxins. So there you then you can foresee that next year for the next uh, silage harvest, it is, it is you should analyze um, or you can also expect which mycotoxins you will find. But the best uh, um, mycotoxin analysis we recommend is the Spectrum 380, which is by Romer Labs or also in combination with Biomin. And it provides the biggest picture of mycotoxins with LC, MS, MS uh, methods, uh, liquid chromatography, and mass mass. And it, it allows the best quality of analysis because there are also options like ELISA, uh, but the problem is that these ones are not suitable for a complex matrix such as uh, uh, such as corn silage. Yeah, that's important to, to point out. You mentioned that um, fumonazins are quite prominently found in corn, so there's a high likelihood that if you're growing corn using that for silage, you could have fumonazins, right? Correct. Yes, and especially in 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 southern regions of Europe. But also, we have also found it in certain regions of Germany and even Poland. So, um, the main countries you should be focusing at is around the south southern part of Europe. If now, if we're talking about Europe, but fumonisins are highly prominent in Latin America, in South Africa, for example, and Turkey, etc. So, okay, so warmer climates, it sounds like. Warmer climate, correct. Correct. Okay. Um, Ignacio, if we could stay with you, um, we have Marian who sends greetings from Nicaragua. Thank you. And <laughs> here the question is, um, you know, we've, we've seen now uh, two products essentially um, that can be used uh, with silage. We've got Fumzyme, we've got Biostabil. Can they be used at the same time? Yeah, correct. Uh, thank you, Marian Jose. <laughs> Greetings. Uh, yes, indeed, this, this product has been developed uh, with this in mind. So the idea is not to make it more complicated to the farmer, but actually that the farmer can mix it with any silage additive. And when we, when we say this, we mean, we mean uh, microbials and we also mean acids. So we've done uh, multiple trials to find out well, what is the compatibility of our product 
and indeed we have uh, proven this to the EFSA authorities so uh, this product is perfect for mixing up with other silage inoculants and to be applied exactly at the same time correct and at the same time are we talking in the same water in the same tank correct in the same in the same tank if you can remember the 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 little graph with the tractor so you can mix it all in the same mixer tank and you apply together uh, at that moment correct okay great i think we've uh, got that question answered then let's see what we have next um ignacio let's do one more on fumzyme what do you know about the stability of Fumzyme, right? If it's being applied to the silage, uh, is, is it active in there for the for the days? I think you showed a significant de decrease in the amount of fumonazins uh, present in the silage, but does that continue to work over a period of days or weeks or months? What is the... Yeah, so all what this enzyme needs to work is uh, a certain level of humidity so once it once it is above 25 20 percent uh, you can ensure that this uh that the enzyme is going to be active so as long as there are a few more this enzyme the, is very precise so it will only uh, degrade a few monocins. as long as there are a few monocins and there is humidity it will stay active and 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 deactivate but of course uh, as as the the enzyme uh, has reached its action and the, the time passes, uh, you can no longer expect that, let's say, that the enzyme that is in the in the silage that will have an effect on the rest of the diet one year after you're feeding it. So it's very very much for activity in the silage. And what we can tell is that the deactivation is not taking, for example, as long as the silage is gonna is gonna be there. Actually, it only takes uh, from six to 10 days, as we showed in the graphs, for the enzyme to degrade all the fumonicins in the silage. Of course, you, of course, you don't open a silage at seven days or, or eight, but you can be assured that already, for example, if you had to open your silage at one month or at three weeks, in case of an emergency, the, the enzyme has already done its activity. Great. Uh, I want to jump on one element that you touched on there, which was uh, moisture levels, uh, but turn to Vesna this time. Uh, this question is about uh, the optimal silage moisture. Is, is there a range that sh we should aim for and are there ways to, to get into that range? What are your thoughts? Yes, it's very much related uh, to the timing of the crop harvest. So we really need to monitor dry matter content uh, of the of the crops uh, in the field and if we if we have for example corn crop and uh, hot weather in august or september when, when we start to harvest so the monitoring of dry matter should be really regularly on the daily basis because at such high, high temperature the dry matter can increase one percent per day so this is really essential to uh, to harvest at the optimum level let's say for the corn between 32 to 38 percent of dry matter is ideal and optimum uh, dry matter content for the ensiling. For the grass, could be something as well between 30, 35 to 45, depending on the type of seals uh, we are using for the storage. Okay. Too wet silage we don't want because we lose nutrients, we lose, we lose uh, energy very fast, so everything can go very easily wrong. Uh, so optimum dry matter content at the harvest is very, very important. Right. Great. Uh, let's uh, talk about the, the second part of the process, Vesna, um, opening the bunk, right? Uh, you mentioned aerobic stability. Uh, what tips do you have in terms of maintaining uh, the, the quality of silage at that point, right? You've, you've shown some results with BioStabil. Yes. Uh, any other tips, any other thoughts on uh, best practices once you open the bunk? Things that are yes. practical yes. advice. Yes, so back again to the to the essentials of the silage management. So we have to be sure, uh, again, for the good aerobic stabilities, back to the dry matter content. Why is dry matter content so important? Because if you have 
high drama or low drama, the compaction will be not properly, will have leave a lot of patches of oxygen, which will then um, dry the undesirable microbials uh, in the in the part of the uh, anaerobic fermentation, which will then lead to the uh, once when silos is open again to the secondary fermentation, and it, silage can go very very fast wrong. On the other side, even if the silage is good compacted, it's very important to maintain good uh, silage pace, so to regularly uh, also um, have adequate uh, removal rate. So if the silage stays exposed to the oxygen too long, we saw in the slides earlier, the yeast start proliferate, molds, uh, molds so you will you end up with very bad silage within a short period of time. So proper uh, removal rate, again, depending on the on the climate where you want, where, where do you live? If it's warmer climate, climate, you have to remove more on the daily basis, maybe in summer, something like 45 centimeters, in winter, something about 15 centimeters. Um, so that's that's a recommendation. So very good silage phase management as well as a, a proper. Uh, removal rate. But of course, in uh, silage inoculants will improve aerobic stability uh, because uh, those ones who are um, having uh, very effective heterofermentative bacteria, which are producing enough acetic acid, acetic acid is antifungal, so it will, it will prevent proliferation of this uh, undesirable microbials one when oxygen is introduced. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for those tips. Uh, Let's talk about you know getting the silage into the animals, right? Um, are there ways to increase uh, silage dry matter consumption? Yes, of course. If we have an excellent or very good silage quality, it will reflect on the dry matter intake by the animals. So um, again, very important is uh, uh, fermentation profile of the silage. We don't want too much acetic acid. We don't want butyric acid inside at all because butyric acid is um, smelling like a virgin to vomit, so animals will refuse it anyway. But uh, even if they need to eat it or if they eat it, it can affect uh, their health, so it's not, not good. If the silage is spoiled by any means, it should not be fed to the animals because uh, you are feeding them with a toxic which, uh, material which influences their health. In many situations, they will refuse to eat. So for sure, good dry matter intake, be sure that the, the, the quality of the silage is superb for your animals. Excellent. Uh, let's see, we have time for perhaps one more question. Uh, let's see, what can you tell us about NDF digestibility, Vesna? Uh, and we're talking about the value of silage. Do you have any yes. experience mm -hmm. there? in relation yes. to the application of biostabil, of course? Um, neutral detergent fiber, um, content of neutral detergent fiber, again, comes from the point uh, towards dry matter content we are harvesting the crops. So it has to be also in the optimum level, so something between 45 to 50 percent for the, for the grasses and, and corn. So we don't want too much of fiber, um, otherwise, or Otherwise, they will not be digestible once when, when digested by the animals. But also, we don't want uh, to be uh, too less as well because fiber is very important for the ruminant animals to, uh, for the improving the fermentation and as well getting uh, the best out of it. So um, during the siling process, uh, digestibility can be slightly improved. But again, the point is to take care of uh, dry matter content so that we don't end up with a higher neutral detergent fiber in the forage and the silage. Great, thank you. Uh, that's going to bring us to the end of our question and answer session. So I want to thank everyone who's uh, submitted a question. For any of those that we haven't had a chance to answer, um, we will follow up. You'll hear from a Biomin representative with an answer to your specific question. Uh, Vesna Ignacio, it's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Uh, if my, my short summary of, of the session was that when, when you're talking about silage production, you need to watch out for bad microbes, so to speak, oxygen is also an enemy, and fumatosins, mycotoxins as well. So with you've also brought the solution in hand, a solution that can be used in combination. Uh, so we appreciate 
you sharing your insights with us today. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ryan. Ryan. Thank and you, Ryan. Thanks. To our live audience, it's been great to have you here. Your participation has been incredibly valuable. If you'd like to hear more, um, please go ahead and contact your Biomin representative. We'd appreciate your feedback on today's session. So as soon as uh, this window closes, you're going to have a short questionnaire, a couple of questions. It should just take a minute or two to answer to let you know uh, your feedback about today and any topics you might want to hear about in the future. Uh, so we hope that this has been valuable for you and that helps you improve the quality of your silage production. On behalf of Biomin, I want to thank you, and we'll see you again next time. Ciao. Thank you.